Welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. I am Amanda McCrossin, and today we are answering a question that I get a lot in the DMs, which is, how do you become sommelier? Som. Sommelier. So many different ways to say this word, and we'll talk about how it's actually supposed to be said. But to answer that question, I have brought on a colleague of mine, fellow sommelier, Molly Green from Cezanne. She is the wine director, beverage director, wine director? Beverage director. Beverage director. You got the whole, the whole shebang. All of it. All of it. Well, welcome to the show, Molly. So good to have you. Thank you so much. I'm really, really, really excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So how do you, how do you say the word? When someone asks you what you do for a living, are you som? Are you sommelier? Sommelier? Depends on the day, but mostly I just say I'm a sommelier. (laughs) <laughs> when I'm so curious when was the first time you heard that word I think I was in my final year at uh, Mizzou and I was taking a wine class because I was in a hospitality program and I was like well what better way to finish my senior year than like drink wine on a Thursday and I went through like a tasting process for like it was like a six-week class mm-hmm. and during that I think I heard the word sommelier for the first time and I was like what is that so that was, God, I don't want to date myself, but 2014. 2014. Okay. Well, we're, we're both going to date ourselves because uh, mine was on a cruise ship when I was probably like 12 years old. So this would have been in the 90s. And <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing it for the first time. And I, I remember we were with like my mom's cousins and they were very fancy and you know, it's the first night of the cruise. Everyone's sitting at dinner. And the captain comes over and he's like, he brings the wine list. And my mom's cousin's the captain. He's like, I'll take that. And he's like, if you wouldn't mind sending the sommelier over. I was like, what is happening right now? I was like, this is the fanciest thing I've ever seen. And this guy came over and then like wine appeared. And I was like, this is really cool. And then I didn't really like think or hear of it too much again until I lived in New York. But I think all throughout my life, wine was sort of like dotted in, but not, you know, not in front of me. I would just like see it in movies and like read about really interesting people drinking really interesting wines that I'd never heard of before. So I don't know. This idea of wine to me was very foreign until I was in my 20s. And I'm assuming for you too, since you didn't hear about it until college. Yeah, I didn't grow up with a family that drank like wine at dinner. Um, like there was always like red table wine um, coming out of that like, oh God, that fiasco. That, yes. Like, bottle, like that's what I remember basket. growing up with. Yeah, but like my parents weren't like they weren't opening a bottle every night for dinner. So like that was never like what I was around. And it wasn't until I went to college and I was like, I think it was, it was honestly from early on, like I just didn't want to drink what anyone else was drinking. And so I started like learning about it on my own. And then you cut to like senior year and then you cut to like where I am now, which is wild. So wild. That's (laughs) quite the pathway. I, but I also love that neither of us came from wine drinking households. Because I think when people think of the wine world and specifically becoming a sommelier, there is this idea that you have to come from it. Like it's almost like you have to come from money or you have to come from privilege in order to access wine, both as a consumer or as a professional. And the more that I get into this business, the more that I surround myself with people who are in it, the more I realize that like most of us actually didn't come from wine. Most of us came from these non-wine drinking backgrounds and just sort of like found ourselves doing some pretty cool shit on the floor at very cool restaurants and serving some wild wines, which it sounds like you just came out of this weekend. Did you say you did a Krug dinner over the weekend? We did. We did a Krug dinner on Wednesday of this week. This is my, I've been at Saison almost two years and this is my third wine dinner. Um, Krug was our biggest. It sold out. Uh, We probably could have done it for two nights, which I am kicking myself a little bit. We didn't, but I think we did, you know, a really intimate setting of 25 guests, which I think is a really good size for our restaurant. It's like, you can have a lot of glasses on the table, but no one's like elbowing each other. Mm. Um, yeah, it was, it's one of the best events that I've worked and been a part of to date. So I was like thrilled with it. What were the wines? So we started off, they released early the 171 or 171st edition. I want to say that properly. 171st edition, uh, getting to taste that. Um, 
like one of the first people to open it was super exciting for me. Yeah. And then we went into 170 and 169 side by side, which I love seeing the 70 and 69 side by side. I think those additions are so different, but really nice to see together. Then we did 2008 Claude Mignon, which I've only had that wine. I can count on one hand how many times I've had that wine, like a full glass. So I was ecstatic. And then we did 168 out of Magnum, which was insane. That wine is showing so well out of large format. Um, And then we did the 27th edition rosé, which again, I've only had the rosé one other time in my entire career back in St. Louis, Missouri. So I remember it specifically. And then we ended with 95 crew collection, which was, I'm going to say wild. It was nuts, bananas. It was crazy. It was so good. You had a really good weekend. I'm super jealous. Just, That's cool. I don't think I've ever tasted any of the Grand Cuvée editions side by side like that, which I think for people who know Krug or don't know Krug, like they do this very interesting thing where all of their editions are different and you can see them on the back of the label, but they're non-vintage, but they're also super special. Usually when we get the edition in, like we just had like the 170 or the 169 for a period of time and you pour yeah. it. I don't get to drink those side by side. Like my yeah. job is cool, but it's not that cool. This yeah. week it was that cool. <laughs> <laughs> and the 2008 Quote I mean, 2008 Champagne, not to like geek out about Champagne for this whole podcast, but like 2008 Champagnes are so beautiful. Sevens they're and so eights, beautiful. but there's something about the eights that I just really, really yeah, love. Yeah. And that wine is so incredibly special and getting, I'm not saying by any means that wine is like ready to drink. Like I'm not telling you to go to your cellar and open the 08. But it was so good for me as a beverage professional to see where it was and to talk to people who exclusively only like want to buy Krug because that's not, that's not my vibe. (laughs) I can't afford that. But getting to see where it was and talk to people that have had like older vintages of it. And they're like, Mm. oh, no, this is going to like age forever. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's, that's really, it was cool for me. I don't get to do that all the time. That is really cool. I don't think it, I mean, most people don't get to do that all the time. No. And I also think like our jobs have opened these doors to places that I don't think either of us could have ever expected. Although I will say Krug, I feel like was there pretty early on in my career. Like Krug is really good at nurturing relationships, I think, with the whole community. Like even though it's a very exclusive wine that's you know expensive. I have really great early memories of working in New York and being invited to Krug events and Krug tastings and like really cool masterclasses. So as much as it can seem like a very exclusionary wine because of its price, I also have to say like I think Krug's done a great job at inviting the the younger generation of sommeliers in to taste some of these really, really exceptional wines to create a longer lasting relationship. Yeah, I agree. I think the gentleman that I work pretty much exclusively with, Roberto Lopi, who I feel like is super well known. He not only donated wine so we could lower the cost of the ticket, but he donated like a bunch of like bags and like. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Well, we have so much to talk about, not just our very cool jobs. You're a very cool job. You're definitely tasting better wines than I am at the moment. However, (laughs) um, we have to talk about what is going on in the wine world. All right. So I don't know how much of the news you've been following, but a few days ago, uh, this poor Los Angeles area wine shop was Venice's Lincoln Fine Wines. There was this guy who like Mission Impossible styled, cut a hole in the ceiling of the Venice wine shop, descended into the store and stole $600,000 worth of wine before disappearing into the night. I have so many questions because one, 600, like, I can, you know how heavy wine is. We've, it's we heavy. carry boxes. It's effing heavy. Yeah. Okay, so number one, this guy, like, was just able to, like, you know, descend from the ceiling and get this. But then he was also, he just, like, escaped into the night. Like, no, he had a, he did the whole thing, which is wild. I have so many, I have so many questions. Like, how, how does this happen? The level of effort to, like, come down from the ceiling, though, is, like, I don't have that much energy. No. That's a lot. No. I also want to know what he stole. Yeah, I would love to know, like, like a full report of what he took with him. They're not saying exactly what it is smartly because I think the wine shop has reached out to some of the wine auction houses. Just be like, hey, if you guys 
see these wines, um, please let us know. They're offering a reward. So if anyone hears of any stolen wine in the LA area, uh, there's a $10,000 reward. And I will say like, you know, as a wine shop, uh, that's a huge devastation. I mean, this is a crazy story, but a huge devastation for this poor wine shop. Um, so I feel terrible that that happened. So it, seriously, if anyone does have any information on like what the heck happened, please do tell. But also like that is insane. Like the level that someone would go to to steal that much wine, I like it couldn't have been a one man job. Like six hundred thousand no. dollars worth of wine. What does that look like? That's a lot of bottles. A decent amount of planning on their half, which is yeah. unfortunate. They must have been watching that store for a long time. Yeah. 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 God, such a shame. Well, my. Thoughts go out to the Venice Wine Shop. Um, I We honestly, truly hope that you're able to figure out what is going on there. In other news, uh, I don't know if you've been seeing an uptick of red wines this summer at Cezanne, but according to Drizzly, people are way more excited about red wine than they are about rosé and white. Uh, sales are up and they're drinking way more chilled reds as it turns out. So what are you seeing at Cezanne? Are people drinking a ton of red wine there? They are. And I feel like um, specifically, like we get to, my job is super fun, right? So like I can kind of put on the by the glass or the pairing something that like I personally would like to drink at the end of the night, which is a bit selfish, but also Mm -mm. we love selfish wine picks, but also like I've noticed that chilled summer reds are people are into them and they weren't Mm -hmm. a few years ago whenever I was working back at Angler because I used to try to push like a chilled red all the time and no one was no one was into it. But this year um, we poured a chilled Pinot Noir coming out of California by Reeve and it's one of their yes. newer labels called Yamoon which I am obsessed with cool and putting that in an ice bucket and then pouring that for a pairing served with a hot course people were like Ooh. can I have another glass of that can we add on yes. another glass they were like people are into it that is really cool what do you so are they asking for it or are they just more receptive to it both. I think um, we put uh, a chilled red on by the glass. We're pouring something that's kept in the white wine fridge on the pairing. And then people are asking more questions about it. But also people are asking for their wine to just be put in an ice bucket to chill it down. Mm. Um, which usually my experience traveling throughout the United States, uh, we like our white wine too cold and the red wine too hot. So this has yeah. been like really nice for me to see. Yeah. I feel like they're finally listening to us. I feel like we've been talking about this for a really long time and they're taking your advice. I don't know why. I don't know like if there's a TikTok out there that I haven't seen yet. or I have talked about like chilled red wines. I love chilled red wines. I have for a very long time. I think they're delicious any time of the year, but but especially like during the summer, you know, I'm not totally ready to give up red wine. Like, and I definitely don't want to drink it room temp uh, ever, but especially during the summer, it's delicious. Um, favorite varietals that you like to be chilled? Well, I mentioned Pinot Noir. Specifically, I like California Pinot just because like I think the aromatics can hold mm. up to it being chilled down a little better. That's my opinion. I, that's a that's a great take. Yeah, I think just personally, I think not that I wouldn't want like a red burgundy chilled down. I'm not saying that. I just think yeah. aromatically California can hold up a little bit better. Um, I also recently have been liking oh, what did we what did we bring in? Chiara Candelo, a really cool female winemaker out of Emilia Romagna. She makes San Giovese. Mm, okay. Her wines chilled down specifically were really good, just like a little bit lower temp. Um, so I think Italian reds, yeah, blanket statement can be chilled for the most part. It, I like Italian red blanket statement. I was just in Italy. Okay. I feel like all of the wines I drank there could have been chilled down very chilled easily. Down. Yeah, yeah. I think I think those are like my broad little my groups. Those are good nuggets. Uh, I would add in this. Well, in Australia, they call them the smashable reds, <laughs> right? Because that's what the Aussies yeah. do. But there's there's a lot of like really good. They have a lot of really good, especially like on the natural style side of things. Um, uh, Okota barrels is, or yeah, Okota barrels is. Yeah. Um, those one wines of those are kind. stellar. Yeah, and I find like you know I think the wines that are less oaked, I think generally are lovelier with more of a chill on them. They can really be treated more like white wines. I think in general, because they have been treated more like a red wine or like a white wine, right? Like usually have a little less skin contact, less tannin, less time in oak, if at all. um, And just really made to be like delicious and crushable. But I think to your point, especially 
with the blanket statement of Italian wines, like I think most red wines can handle being chilled down. You know, I think so they're gonna, I agree they're gonna warm up. Um, and red burgundy as well. I'll throw red burgundy in there. I'll take that at pretty much any temperature, though. So yeah, I'll take. Yeah, I'm not like guilty. <laughs> like I'll take whatever. <laughs> This is our moment to let you know that if you are loving this show, this is your time to like, subscribe, and review this podcast. Uh, it, re- it really helps us, honestly. I know I shout it from the rooftops every time I talk about it, but uh, we really appreciate it. I read the reviews. They're lovely and wonderful and charming, and we're so appreciative of, of them. So if you're listening to this podcast and you like what we're doing, please go ahead and leave us a review. If you're watching it on YouTube, this is your moment to give us a virtual cheers with your wine glass and hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to be notified. We post more things, uh, which I think you're going to want to do. This is also your moment to grab the wine from your unfiltered podcast wine club club shipment. This week, we are doing the Crozet and Retage from Gigal. If you are not a member of the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast Wine Club, which is a mouthful, I admit, this is your moment to rectify that. Come hang out with us. Every single bottle corresponds with an episode. It's four bottles every other month. I think the price includes shipping. And uh, you also get 10% off of your purchases at Wine Access, which is lovely. So, And I pick the wines myself. So we get to have a good time um, with wines, as we discussed earlier, that are selfish picks. These are all wines that I personally want to drink. Nothing else. There is literally never going to be anything in this shipment that I'm not going to personally drink. Because if I don't want to drink it, I'm not drinking it. So that's I simple. love that. That's so great. <laughs> That's all we roll here. All right, everybody grab your glasses, grab your wines. We'll be back in just a second. All right, we are back and I have two wines with me today. Of course, the podcast wine club that I just mentioned. We've got the 2020 Gigal Croze Hermitage. This is coming from the Northern Rhone, 100% Syrah. If you want to watch the full tasting video of that, you can do so. I'll link it. Um, both in the show notes as well as in the, to be pro- here in the YouTube video. Uh, and then the other wine that we have is the Trimbach Pinot Gris. This is not in the wine club shipping. This is an additional wine that when I asked Molly, hey, do you think we should have a second wine? She's like, sure, let's do it. Um, this was uh, an Alsatian wine was her suggestion. So we're drinking the 2016 Trimbach Pinot Gris Reserve. This is coming from Alsace. Um, We're going to talk a little bit more about what makes this wine super special. But before we do that, before we get super, super into these wines, um, let's talk about our guests because Molly, as you mentioned, you are the beverage director at Saison in San Francisco. You have been since 2021. You went to University of Missouri, got a degree in finance and hospitality management, wanted to be on the operations side, and yet here you are running the program for one of the most important restaurants, not only in the country, but in the world. How does it feel to be you right now? Feels good. Most days, it feels really good. Um, I'm pretty lucky. And that's not lost on me. I would like to be very clear that like this job is, this is like what I've always wanted to do, which is really cool. Was it truly something you always wanted to do? I know you wanted to work in hospitality, but not on this side, right? Right. So I guess- you're correct. I think originally, like I knew I wanted to work in operations. I thought I would go into like the logistics side of things and work like on the back side, like never working like full time, like front of house. Um, but I waited tables throughout college and then I landed an internship at the Four Seasons and they needed help in banquets. And I was like, okay, like I need money. I'm like 23, 24. Mm. And then it became banquets to working the morning shift and then morning shift working with some of the most talented beverage professionals to this day that I've met. It was like a really small, intimate group and their Mm. PM service. And that was it for me. I like fell headfirst into wine. It was like Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole and I never got back out. Once you're in, you're in. There's no coming out of it. Like, no, let this be a warning. Yeah. Let this be a warning to anyone who's listening. Who's like, I think I maybe want to get into wine. I mean, I assume since you're listening to this podcast, you're probably into it, but if you want to get into a career in wine, that is a very different rabbit hole. And I think in order to talk about that, we need to at least take a sip of our wine before we get started. Cause I think our respective journeys have been very interesting ones, long ones and ones that are probably not done. So cheers to you, Molly. Thanks for joining me. Cheers. Um, oh, I love pretty. You got a Zalto there. Yeah. You know, half to. why not? Yeah. Um, Ooh, this wine is very aromatic. I mean, for fresh out of the gate, it's gorgeous. Yeah. 
I only poured this right when we first started and it's like, it's super like violety and rosy and meaty and salty and olivey. Mm. It's like a little um, charcuterie plate. Totally. I picked this wine because this is a wine that I think once you taste it for the first time, you never really forget it. And I, I don't necessarily mean this producer, but I, like I remember drinking wine in my early 20s. And, you know, it's mostly like Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio or Chardonnay or Cabernet or whatever. But like Syrah, probably more than any other grape, made such an indelible mark into my tasting journey that you were like, oh, like there are so many specific aromatics and flavor profiles in Syrah and specifically from Northern Rhone Syrah, especially from a benchmark producer like this, that you're like, oh, now I kind of get it. And I have to assume for you it was maybe a similar situation. Yeah. Do you know what's kind of wild is last night we had this really great table come in and he was like, oh, your Rhone selection is so great. What should we drink? And I was like, well, if I was going to order something, I would order the 82 Egal La Moline. <gasps> and he was like, yeah, that's what you would drink. And then he bought it. And it was it was like the wine. It's probably one of the best wines I've sold all year. Wow. So it was wow. meant to be like, and then today I get to come and I get to drink the Crow's Hermitage 2020. And I got to sell like an 82 last night, which is nuts. That is nuts. That's super cool. Yeah. It's, I've never it's, had it's an 82 like, La Moline. Yeah, me either until last night. So uh, <laughs> it's interesting because the producer in itself, the style of wine, like you just know that it's going to deliver such an important moment, like no matter which one you're drinking, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so getting to taste this, you know, like fresh, vibrant, young, vintage, it's it's like still an amazing wine, which is iconic. Yeah, I... Couldn't agree more. I think this is a wine that you don't have to age it. You can't age it. You can drink it cold. You can drink it whatever temperature this is right now. You can drink it by itself. You can drink it with food. Like, it's just, like I said, it left such an indelible mark on me. And can and every time I have it, subsequently, I'm like, oh, Syrah is just such a cool grape. Like, it just gives you so much. And I think whenever I'm feeling a little, like, uh, down on myself with wine tasting, like, it's always a grape that I can go back to or a wine I can go back to and just be like, all right, let's break this out a little bit. Like let's separate some of the things that I'm smelling versus tasting uh, and start to assign. Because I think if you're looking to get into tasting wine, this is one of the more obvious ones that you can kind of play around with and not feel so lost. Like there's some very specific markers in here. Um, to back up a little bit, because I'm sure, do you get asked a lot, like how did you become a psalm? Or like if I want to be get into wine, like how do I get into wine? Do you get asked that a lot? Yeah. I think maybe like once a night working the floor, which is That's a like, lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think people are interested in like how you get here, like specifically like on the floor, all you're doing is like touching wine. People yeah. are like really curious about it. I mean, my parents still don't fully understand what I do. Yes. They're always like, <laughs> what are you up to? And I'm like, mom, I got to go. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I get asked all the time. I still get asked all the time. I get tons of DMs about it, as I alluded to in the beginning of this podcast. It's a question that I feel, I feel a few ways about. One, I always feel not always sure how to answer. And I think I feel not always sure how to answer because there are so many different pathways. And I think also there's so much luck involved in doing what we do. Like, I think obviously, you know, if you're someone that believes that like luck is where preparation and timing come together, like, I think I do believe that's what luck is. But I also think that I just happen to be at the right place at the right time in my hospitality career and I asked the right person the right question and it just opened these doors for me. Um, and I think maybe I don't want to assume, I think there's, you know, there's some luck involved perhaps in making some of the transitions that you've made, but to, to back up, I think if you're talking about how to become a sommelier, there are two clearer ish paths, right? There's court of master sommeliers, which is not how you become a sommelier, that is how you uh, get your certification to become a sommelier. And then there's the W set. So there's the Wine and Spirits Education Trust. And these are both educa educating and certifying bodies. And I, I want to make that distinction because I think when people see these things out in the wild, they're like, oh, I just need to get these certifications. I just need to go through these classes and then I'll become a sommelier. And you're shaking your head because you know it's not true, right? No, if this is not, not how true. you become a som. Um, yeah. It is by working and living and breathing so I think my first question to you is like, if you were to do this all over again, how would you do it? And is it, is it the same or is it different? I honestly think 
I would take the same path, but I wish that I just realized early on that it's not it. The certifications, in my opinion, you do for yourself. Yes. Like that doesn't make or break like who's professional. Some of the best beverage professionals I've met in my company, outside of my company, don't hold certifications and they are Mm -hmm. way smarter than me. They're way better on the floor than I am and they work hard. So the certification for me, like I did my first two levels with the quartermaster Psalms and I'm very grateful for that. Um, But now it's about me pushing and I wish I would have known that early on. Like when I was first starting off and I was like a lot younger, a little bit younger, I just thought I needed a floor song position. I was like, I don't want to take a captain role. I don't want to be a server. I don't want to be a bartender. I just need to touch bottles. And that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have like checked myself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, Because now I can look back five years ago and be like, okay, what you did was great. But like, maybe you shouldn't have like turned down that job and been like Mm. a brat about it. Mm, That's interesting. What did you do first to get in? Was it, did you read a book? Did you take a class? Did you work on the floor? Like, what do you think is like your, the first moment that you're like, I feel like I'm starting to learn about wine in a very real way. I held a serving position at the Four Seasons and I really wanted to not work AM because I was 24 and going out all the time. And I was like, mm-hmm. I really would like to not wake up at 6 AM. And they told me that if I wanted to move to PM, I had to learn the wine list. And it was an all male server captain team. And there was one other female and her name was Morgan Gray, who lives up in Sonoma and works for Reeve Winery. And she's to this day, one of my best friends. And she was like, I think we just have to like sit in on their tasting group. And I was like, Oh my God, these guys are so intimidating, but they let us sit in on it. We had to buy in with our own money. We were putting like a hundred dollars down for a tasting group And one of the guys named Patrick would source the most wild wine, like 1982 Oprion was, yeah, I'm not kidding. Like it was that moment. That was when I learned about wine. I didn't even know what that, I couldn't even tell you anything intelligent about that wine. (laughs) I tasted it. And, but the fact that like I had to buy in with my own money and like we did it after work, I would have to come back after like I had been asleep for like a few hours and they would be closing down the restaurant. And that was like where I was like all in. Did you know at that point what a first growth was or what Bordeaux was or like how deep in it? Cause I, I mean, I remember those early moments where you're tasting some badass wines and you're like, I don't know shit about shit, but like, let's just do it. No, and I, I honestly think back to that, like first tasting that I sat in on and it was like in a private dining room, like at like midnight. And I was like, I cannot believe I tasted some of those wines. I didn't, I, when I say I can't tell you anything intelligent about those wines on that day, I'm not lying. Like I remember being embarrassed at a lineup because one of the captains had asked me like, okay, so like, tell me what you smell. And I was like, I don't know what I'm smelling. Like that was, that yeah. was me in 2014, which is yeah. nuts. 2014, which is, so not even a decade ago, right? No. You're tasting 82 of Brian. Can't. Can't name a single thing about the wine. No. Uh, standing standing at a lineup at the Four Seasons, you're like, I don't know what's going on. And now you're running the wine program at this restaurant, right? So like that's you know a pretty know, intense I mean, nine year trajectory. Um, probably should <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the things that we go through a lot, and not to make this a therapy session about songs, but I think a lot of the, the time we are dealing with massive imposter syndrome because every, it is every day. Yeah. It Because you are, I mean, as, as you just said, you sold a wine that you'd never tasted before. You could infer based on other vintages and other bottlings and other things that you've had and everything that you've learned throughout the course of your Psalm journey. But a lot of the times, and I found this at Press as well, a lot of the times you are recommending bottles that like you don't have personal experience with. And so, th- you know, then you do have to lean on like this theory and experience and just kind of like fingers crossed that this is going to work. I think for me, it was a very similar story. Like not, not in that I needed to, in order to get a job, I needed to learn about wine, but I was working at a private club in Manhattan and I was there, there was a somebody who had worked at La Bernadette. He'd worked under Aldo and he started and he was our AGM. And I was just was like one night, Hey, like, I just have questions. Like, do you think you could like recommend a book to me? And he said, no, he said, I'm not recommending a book. I'm going to give you five questions. And tomorrow you have to come back to me with the answers. And so I said, okay, 
like what are the questions? So he gives me the questions and I don't remember exactly what they were, but like I remember one of the questions was what are the first five growths of Bordeaux? Uh, the first, what are the, fir- what are the five first growths of Bordeaux? What are the Grand Cru's of Chablis? They were questions like that. And I had absolutely no idea yeah. in the world what that meant. Like not even an, nothing. I just looked at the questions. I was like, all right, see you later. I remember going to Equinox, like working out on my bike, like Googling these questions, trying to find the answers to them, trying to figure that. So then having to backtrack, like what the hell is a first growth? Like there's a classification. Why would there be a classification for wines? Like that doesn't make any sense. Like all of these things and this rabbit hole that you start going down that you're like, wait, like this is, this isn't just one question that I can, I have to come back with the answer with. Like it's a lot of different questions that I have to know the answers to. And then you get super overwhelmed. But I think it was in that moment that I realized just as someone that was super, super curious and enjoyed learning, like I think, you know, I'm I'm someone that really enjoys learning in a way that makes sense for me, that if I was going to do this, it was going to require a lot of self-study and a lot of work. Um, and that got me super excited, but it also got me super nervous because I, like I said, it is this completely different world. And so when I think when people ask me this question, like, how did you get into wine? I think back to those panic moments of like, there's so much. I literally don't know where to start. It feels like too much, but like, we're just going to chip away at it piece by piece. And so I was lucky in that he ended up enrolling me in classes with the American Somali Association. I took their first like viticulture vinification class that was like every Monday, 10 a.m., three hours, a lot of self-study in between. And I like, I remember vividly like feeling like at the end of that class, I was like, I'm going to fail this class. But it also like threw me into the deep end and forced me to really, really, really look at something with brand new eyes that were my own. Um, that said, like I, like you, I, I got my certifications, but I never felt strongly enough about getting a certification through the court of master assemblies or anybody for that matter, because I felt like what I was learning was so important and so much so much more interesting than I was going to learn on flashcards. And there's nothing wrong with rote memorization for other people, but for me, it wasn't how I wanted to learn. Um, and so that's how I, I got on my initial path. And I think for some people, that's a really great way to go if you have a mind that's akin to mine, but for some people it's not. And so for, you know, in that, in that vein, I'm like, yeah, like go take a W set class, like pick up a book, watch a movie, like on wine, just start like familiarizing yourself with wine. Cause I think the more that you can just familiarize yourself with all these little weird effing things that exist in this world that we probably take for granted right now, the better it's going to be for you. So once you got past uh, feeling like you didn't know anything about an 82 at Brian, when did, when did things start to click? Like at what point did you feel more comfortable? Patrick, who was like running that like tasting group, he was like, you should sign up for your first level. And I was like, I don't know. That's like a big commitment. Like I, you know, you like, don't know if you can do it. And he was like, Molly, just sign up. And like, when you have something to look forward to, like, you're going to push yourself a little bit more. So I signed up, I went down to Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is (laughs) beyond. Um, and I did the two day like intro course and I left there and I still have people that I talk to, to this day that I met on that, in that course, um, for the intro exam. And I was, I was just like, okay, I can like do this. Like I can, I understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't understand all of it, but I understand most of it. And I was like, like, I can actually put my head down and I can study and I think I can do this, which was cool. Did you end up becoming a sommelier at the Four Seasons when you were there or was it not until you got to California? It was, I worked at the Four Seasons for a few years and then, um, giving like Patrick shameless plugs. So <laughs> Patrick Wolf is still <laughs> one of my best friends to this day. He runs MMH, MMHL out of like Austin area, um, okay. McGuire Mormon hospitality. He's absolutely brilliant, but he got a job opportunity to open a wine bar in St. Louis um, and like be the, the, the GM and the beverage director. And he asked if I would go over with him and to be very clear, Patrick and I did not get along. Like he mm. was mean, to me, but he was mean because he like wanted me to like be better and he pushed me, mm-hmm. but that's not the way I learn. I was like, God, this guy is so rude to me, but <laughs> he asked me to come over and I was like, oh, I don't know. Like I have a really good thing at the four seasons. I was making good money. I was captaining and mm. I was selling whatever wine I wanted. Cause there wasn't really a full-time Psalm on the floor. So you could mm. kind of do 
not do whatever you wanted, but you could sell whatever you wanted. And he was like, I think the next step in your career is getting bar exposure. And he was like, why don't you come over and be a bartender and like, help me like, just like elevate this experience. And it took me about six months. And then I finally left the four seasons and went over to a little wine bar called Louie's. And it was one of the coolest things in St. Louis at the time. They had like a big chalkboard and he would bring in like crazy things and serve it by the glass. Like we did a flight of Cardinal. Oh, that's cool. In St. Louis, Missouri. Like what were we doing? That was silly. But it was just like those things. Um, And that is what I did for about a year and a half, two years until I moved to San Francisco in 2018. And why did you move to San Francisco? Personal wise, I had met someone and I moved out here, but I would, I don't think I ever would have left St. Louis if I didn't uh, meet somebody Mm -hmm. and he had worked out here in San Francisco. And I was like, okay, like this is like my time. Like I'm 28, like I want to get out of St. Louis. And so I moved and then um, that was it. I have, I mean, I've been here five years, which is pretty cool. I moved to California and I was 28 too. Look at us, we're twins. I know, I know. (laughs) One of the responses that sometimes I'll give people when they ask me about becoming a psalm is, and you're kind of just proving this right now. I, not that you know St. Louis isn't you know a major city, but I think one of the things that I often tell people is, go to a city with a great wine scene or move to a wine producing region because I think being immersed in that culture is, as I said before, like you really do have to immerse yourself in the wine culture because there's too much to learn. It's going to be impossible to learn it all in books. Do you think that you've learned more being in California, which is not, not only in California, but San Francisco, which is not only a huge Mecca of great wine culture, but then you're also a hop, skip and a jump from the country's best wine regions. Would you say that it, it was more beneficial for you to be there? Or do you think you could have feasibly had a great career, uh, staying in St. Louis? So I am kind of split because to this day, the tasting group I had in St. Louis, the community I had in St. Louis, I, I still haven't been able to replace that. Mm. Like I miss that tasting group every day. Um, and they are like that St. Louis Psalm community is, there's some killers, like they are legit, but I think the hands-on experience and being able to touch bottles yeah. And work with elevated food. I couldn't have done that in St. Louis. Like I, if I could move back to St. Louis and have my group that I had, I would, but I know mm-hmm. I would be doing myself a disservice because I wouldn't have the chefs that I have out here. I wouldn't have Napa and Sonoma and Oregon in Santa Barbara, like literally a cheap yeah. commute. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, being out here changed my whole life. Um, it changed everything. There is something to be said about being in a place like St. Louis that has a great community, right? Because I think, I think you Thank do you. get a little closer, right? Being in a, a smaller area that's a little bit more concentrated and it does kind of maybe force you in a way to like, you know, have these great tasting groups where New York, I lived, so I lived in New York and I worked in New York before this. I think New York had a great community, but it was, it's, it's New York. Like it was very competitive. Like, you know, There were some people that had my back and there were some people that definitely did not have my back. Um, And as much as I loved learning initially in New York and, you know, you have, there's so much there, right? Like just like in San Francisco, all the distributor tastings are there. All the importer tastings are there. All of the events are there. Like there's some really cool things that you will get exposed to in places like New York and in San Francisco. But I think for me moving to California and to Napa specifically, um, you know, I think Napa, Napa is obviously different than San Francisco, but you do have the elevated cuisine because you are working in a place that has Michelin starred restaurants. So in a lot of ways, I feel like I had the best of both worlds. But for me, one of the huge, huge things that happened to me in my wine career was working in a wine region and talking to winemakers because there was a, yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at me right now. Like, you know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) I'm, I'm jealous of like, you because you get to like be around winemakers and people that have like built companies every day Mm. from like nothing um yeah I think about like moving to wine country every day and then I'm like oh I can't do it but no I'm (laughs) I'm, like what you experience is so different than what I experience and we're 45 minutes from each other right right they are very different um I think one of the things that it allowed me to do that I never expected I mean I should have known but I never expected was 
it allowed me to formulate opinions around wine that were mine in that I didn't need a book to tell me what I needed to think about certain things. Like I could see farming firsthand. I could see what organic vineyards look like versus conventionally farmed vineyards. I could see, you know, the barrels in the winery. I could see the different, like you, there's just, there's something about seeing it firsthand and making firsthand observations that cannot be replaced by a book. And I think that, in and, and then like talking with the winemakers about why they chose to do certain things and getting to see that over the course of a long extended time, because I think trips are great and you can learn a lot from visiting region and you absolutely should be visiting regions. If you want to be in this business, you have to travel. Um, but there was something about talking to these people on a more personal level that I think gave me different insight and, like I said, allowed me to form opinions for myself. And that, to me, is what made me a great psalm in my – like, for me, it was what I wanted more so than a pin. It's not to take away from anyone, right? If you want the pin, you should get the pin. But for me, it was about experience and it was about conversation. It was about being able to talk to tables as me and not as uh, someone repeating something that they learned out of a book. That was important. Do you, so you're, you're dead, like no, no Napa for you. Like you are happy in San Francisco. I mean, no, no, I'm not going to say that because I, <laughs> I would, I'm like, I love this city, but I have, um, like, I want like a little bit more of a normal life. And I would love like a house with like a backyard that like, I didn't have to go to like Dolores park to get, um, <laughs> I would love to move to wine country in a few years, um, or somewhere that's outside of the city, but I'm committed to this city for like a few more years. Like they can't get rid of me yet, but, um, I really do love Sonoma specifically. I like Healdsburg mm-hmm. area a yeah. lot and it's yep. growing and what they're doing up there is ugh, so cool. Yeah. You've got, you've got a three Michelin starred restaurant there. You've possibly got another two to three Michelin star coming up with Cyrus in Geyserville. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. both of, yeah, I think there's a lot going to happen up there. So, but I got a few more years here. I think you inadvertently brought up an interesting point that I wanted to touch on around the how to become a sommelier thing. Cause I think this idea of becoming a psalm is very, very beautiful in theory, right? Like we've talked about all the great experiences that we've had as psalms, serving Krug, drinking Krug, talking about 82, La Moulin's, but the reality is, like, if you want to become a psalm and you want to do it in the traditional sense, meaning sommelier person who serves wine at a restaurant, because I think there's a few, we can talk about that in a second. There's a few different iterations of the word. But if you want to be a psalm in the traditional sense at a restaurant, the lifestyle, I think, is first and foremost something that you very much need to consider because it is not for everyone. I came from a theater background, so nights and weekends, holidays. They were gone already for me. It was no thing. My family was used to it. For a lot of people who are coming from nine to fives and they DM me and they're like, hey, I think I want to leave my nine to five and getting to wine and become a psalm. The first thing I ask them is like, are you prepared to give up nights, weekends, holidays, and seeing your family for a pretty long time? Now, granted, the hospitality industry is getting a little bit better about balance, but it's not great. You're going to miss a lot of things. And I think that's just like, that's the name of the game. How have you found balancing your life in this industry? Because it's not... It's not all beautiful sometimes. We have to do inventory. It's effing cold in cellars. Like there's a lot of things about being a psalm that are not glamorous. Yeah, I think I am still trying to figure out the balance. I've done well with it this year specifically, and we're only like seven, almost eight months in. But for the first like four years I was here, I worked as much as they needed me to work. I was kind of low man on the totem pole when I started off at Angler. So anytime they needed a six day, I was like, I'm here, I'm available. I worked every Sunday because uh, people that had more experience or were like higher up than me wanted Sunday and Monday off, which fine, I'll, I'll work whatever day you want me to work. Um, I was considered a seller rat for whatever <laughs> they needed admin. Like I organized that seller. I printed stickers. I inventoried by myself when like people were out of town. Um, I missed a lot of family events, birthdays, my own holidays, my own birthday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it wasn't until maybe the past like year that I really got to take a step back because now I have two very strong professionals that work under me who I'm very thankful for, but now I can have an admin day or like I can go see my parents on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, I'm, I'm five years in, which 
isn't healthy. No, Molly, you're nine years in. (laughs) I'm nine years in, but I'm five (laughs) years into being a full-time song. I'm nine years in the industry, like professionally, like elevated. Yeah. But I mean, it took me five years to like get my shit together. Get a day off. And I'm still like not like I'm like I'll go into work tomorrow. Like I need to calm down. Do you still the inventory thing is a is like a funny topic because like I think whenever someone brings up inventory, they're like they look at oh god, it's July thirtieth right now, isn't it? I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's fine. We have a very like I'll ask my team to come in at noon on Tuesday and they're gonna be not happy with me, but I don't care. For the okay, so for those who like don't know what we're talking about, invent you so you have to inventory your seller. It's you know the way that we keep track of things. It's the way that the you know the accountants know that we're not just drinking the La Moline and selling instead of selling it. Um so one of the things that you have to do, and for every restaurant, it's different. Some restaurants are once a month. I've heard restaurants that do every week, every other week. Usually it's once a month and it's usually right at the, the start of the month. So it's usually the first of the month. Um, and it is a herring process. It is a, depending, it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter what your system is. Like, it's always like, where's this bottle? Where do we put this bottle? And so I think for those of us in the industry um, who have to do inventory, my question to you now as a beverage director uh, do you still like, do you still sweat about inventory? Like, it doesn't matter how many great people we have underneath of you. Like, it's still a shit oh, show yeah. every yeah. single <laughs> And I think the wild thing is, I took for granted all I did at Angler was scan, right? Like, I yes. had been, well, we have been wise, they still have it. You have a scanner, you scan, and then I would like go home and Morgan. Yep. Paris would deal with the repercussions of like, Molly, you double scanned this item or you missed a whole wall. And I yep. wouldn't have to deal with that. <laughs> and now that I'm where it says on, like, oh my God, last month I was like, so Danny and Savannah work underneath me. Um, and I was like, did you guys not scan the large format? And they were like, oh, sorry. And I was like, can you just scan the large format? <laughs> I can see it in my report. And I'm like, why are we missing a three liter of Joseph Phelps? Like what happened? So yeah, it's I, worse. Now. I know those texts well. <laughs> I I I miss the days where like my responsibility was like light. Now I'm responsibility heavy and yeah. inventory itself takes a day and a half, but then like me investigating it takes a day and two days of me and a computer and I'm like drained. Yeah. It's a it's a dra- it's a process that like when you think about like if you don't know what's going on, you're like how hard can it be? Like you just have a scanner. It's like you're at the grocery store, just scan every bottle. It's, it's, ugh, if you've never done it, it I, God bless you. Um, and what's so funny is when I came over here, I had never like investigated inventory before. So I would call Morgan and Robert, um, who are still at Angler. And I'd be like, can you guys just come help me like, look at this. So they would come over on their days off and like, look at my reports and they'd be like, okay, this is what you have to do now. Cause I started this job and I was like underqualified. Like I know, I know, I know that feeling like, well. Yes. Yeah. 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 But the moment that you're promoted from SOM to wine director and you get no instructions on how to be a wine director or what the difference is, is a yeah. terrifying moment. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is like, when I say there's no rule book to becoming a sommelier, there is no rule book. Like you literally could get promoted out of being a seller rat and like, you'll be on the floor. And exactly. <laughs> I remember my first day on the floor as a SOM and the the former SOM who came in before me was like, all right, well, we just got this Sauvignon Blanc in and, um, yeah, fun. And I was like, you have like no other instructions for me? Like, you're just going to like let me go like talk to human beings about wine? He's like, yeah, like this is your job now. Like, go do it. And I remember like the, you know, graduating from school or whatever and doing that first night of service. Like, I don't have, like, I Googled stuff in the back. Like, I don't know any of these wines on the wine list. Like, I'm literally back there. Like, wait, what's the difference between like the Sunsair versus that Sunsair? Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So there is like a lot of throwing into the deep ocean, like, throwing, getting thrown into the ocean and just like, sink or swim. <laughs> yeah. When I, when they opened Angler, I would sit down, I would come in like an hour before service and I would just ask like Robert and Morgan for help. And we started with champagne and then we had to go to Chablis and then we had to go to like actual, the rest of Burgundy, which I was so scared of selling. Yes. Um, and for the longest time I like wouldn't sell anything over like $200. I was like, no, no, no. Like I can't, like, I don't know what to do. And now Ooh. I'm selling like, I know you're, it's like, I literally was like, I had like my, I still have my notebook. I have producer profiles of like champagne producers I had never heard of when I started at Angler. Mm, okay. Yeah. I have, I have those notebooks too. They're all California producers and I would make Kelly White go through like every single, I remember one night I, 
I made her answer so many questions that she literally looked at me and she was like, I'm so sorry. I have to go get a sip of water because my mouth is so dry from talking from so much. I mean, like in the nicest Kelly way possible, but like I just, I had so many, cause I had, I walked into press like from California or from New York, which yeah. was all European. And I, I got one of the deep end of the ocean. Like you don't know what 65 crew tastes like, like figure it out. <laughs> That's on you. And, yeah. And, and working in Napa, like you have to know the producers, like you, you have, have to, to like, you, you cannot be your way out of it. Story, like how yeah. they tasted in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, that's a you had some pressure. I had some pressure. We worked through it. It was fine. Talking to guests. That I think that's another big component. There's a psycho- psychology experiment going on every night with talking to guests. I think it's interesting that you had the same problem that I think a lot of psalms do, which is selling wines that are more expensive than what you could potentially afford. It's a weird, weird place to be in. Um, I think when you're working at restaurants like you are and I was, and you're, most of the wines are over $200 and can be well into the thousands of dollars. Um, how do you, how do you navigate that? How did you get comfortable with it? Personally, my biggest strength is service. Like I can talk to whoever I could talk to a wall, um, if I had to, but I think just learning that the guest is going to feel comfortable if you feel comfortable. So like for the first, maybe six to 10 months when I got hired with the company, I was like really nervous or I didn't want to go over to tables. I was like, no, like Robert and Morgan and Margaret can like handle that. Mm -hmm. And like, they can all just like go get the bottles for them. But then you're put into positions where like, there's no one else around and like, you're going to have to answer questions. And I hate saying fake it till you make it. But like, I just had to, I had to get confidence. So being comfortable talking about wines, drinking a little bit more wine outside of work that I was unfamiliar with also gave me confidence and just having a support system. Like to this day, I still have a group text with the four of us that opened Angler as the Mm. wine team. And I will get wines in or I'll have a pairing question. And I just text them because A, they're not going to judge me. And they support me in this role. So I, where I lack in like a little bit of confidence still, I make up for like being able to talk to guests um, too well. Like I could be friends with anyone on this floor if I had to. I think that's important. I don't think there's enough of that actually. I think um, I think one of the things that I saw and still see a lot is uh, when a Psalm approaches a table and the first thing that they say is, do you have questions about the wine list? It's, it's something that I stopped doing. I don't know when, but I stopped doing because I felt, I felt like it was this weird psychology where the guest was immediately put into this position of deference where they, they had to feel like I was in charge and they were not. And I always found that that was a a really weird dynamic to sort of, to have to navigate through. And so my approach was always just like, you know, especially being in Napa, it was so much easier, right? Like, are you guys having a great trip so far? Like, where are you staying? Where are you, like, where are you visiting from? Like, are you celebrating anything? And so the first few, you know, seconds of that conversation, even on busy nights, it was so important for me, at least in the way that I navigated selling wine, was to really have a conversation with them, a small one, just to make that initial relationship to, like, let them know that, like, I'm a human being, first and foremost. And I know that you're human beings first and foremost. And like, we can have a conversation that doesn't require you feeling like an idiot because I, I want, I need, I need you to be comfortable enough to, for us to have to move forward in what we're about to do, which is, you know, is essentially a transaction. I also like take a lot of pride in, I don't use words like purazines or mm, like yeah. VA, like at a table. I don't talk to the guests like they're in my tasting group. I don't even talk to them like they may know anything about wine. I just want them to be comfortable. So the question I always ask is, what would you like to drink tonight? Do you have something that you normally like? And if they say something or like price is really like a thing with people. So I'm like, what are you comfortable with tonight? And then I have the luxury that like I can move price points around a little bit. So if I need to lower the cost of a bottle to get it under a hundred dollars, I'll do it. I just want people to have a good time. I always say my job is easy. I put things in cups and I make sure the guest <laughs> is happy. That's literally my job. Like I'm like a, I'm like a, I, I would like the title of vibe specialist. Yeah. They want me to have a beverage director title, which is fine. Whatever. All I want to do is like make people happy. So like, if that means like 
giving them like Cabernet with caviar. Like I will give it to you. I will do whatever you want. Whatever you want. Cabernet caviar. Let's, let's make, have a party. Let's um, have a party. Speaking of caviar, I haven't really touched my Trimbach Pinot Gris, which I was, I was actually having fun with last night and I was smelling and I was sort of tasting it. And, um, I don't know if you feel this way. Maybe I over-index on this too much. I'm always fascinated. This is, I think I said what it is, right? 2016 Trimbach Pinot Gris. So good. It never ceases to amaze me that Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio are the same goddamn grape. Gets me every time. It's wild. wild. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. They could not be more different when they are made in different ways and come from different places. This is from Alsace and it's viscous and it's like peachy and lychee and like in some ways reminds you of Riesling, but like doesn't have like the petrol on it. Like it just, there's right. so many things about this wine that you're like, Pinot Grigio should not be made in this way. And yet we're totally fine when it's called Pinot Gris and it's made in this way. Because if you yeah. were to give me a Pinot Grigio from like Friuli and it tasted like this, you'd be like, nah, this isn't, no. this isn't what I had in mind. No. So you specifically requested an Alsatian wine. Why? I did. So whenever I was ugh, young and not so tired back in the day at Four Seasons, I went to, I got invited to go to Paris with um, like a colleague and one of her friends from home. And they were like, yeah, we just like wanted to invite you because I know like you're studying wine now and we were going to like rent a car and go to Alsace. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I'm not like there yet. But then I was like, you know what? I can do this. Like I can afford this trip. So we flew to Paris. We stayed in Paris for a few days and then we rented a car and drove to Alsace. And to the to this day, like no matter how many wine trips I get to go on um, or like what I get invited to, like this was the most beneficial trip for me. I had no idea what I was looking for. I didn't make any producer appointments. I was literally tasting with producers that don't get imported to the United States in their nice. garage. Nice. And getting to like drive throughout that region um, is like bar none. Like it's like the best experience I've had in my life. So Alsace holds a very special place in my heart. Um, and I also like, I prefer to drink these wines like on my day off. Like I like wine, mm. trim up, you know, agree like every day. Yeah, I agree. I eat Thai food as much as humanly possible. And Alsatian, Riesling, and Pinot Gris are my two favorite things with Thai food. So always, I had Thai, I had Thai food for dinner last night. This was delicious, the Thai food also today when I had it for lunch before this podcast. Yeah. Because that's what I do on a weekend. Um, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. You know, it's a hard life and it's a hard job and somebody has to do it. The word psalm and something that gets thrown around a lot. And I think as we alluded to earlier, you know, this this terminology can, I think, be ascribed to many different professions, especially now. I think traditionally, you know, the sommelier was the person in the restaurant that brings the bottles. And I think today we would still very much not exclude everything else to for that to be the only meeting. But um, if you want to be in the wine industry and you want to get your sommelier certification, there are other jobs that you can get in this industry that are not hospitality based. Like you can be an importer, you can be a distributor, you can work at a retail shop, you can work at an online wine retail shop. Um, you can do what I do now, which is not really a psalm in the traditional sense, but I'm, you know, a social media psalm, right? Like I get to yeah. talk and recommend to lots, you know, uh, recommend lots of wines to lots of different people uh, that I've never met before in my life. Um, so I think I just wanted to to point that out because I think Initially, when I was early on in my career, I was like, no, a psalm is just the person in the restaurant. You can't call yourself a psalm if that's if that's not what you're doing. But I think I've sort of opened up that definition a little bit for myself in the last few years. Maybe that was a biased move on my part since I don't work at restaurants anymore. But uh, do you have any feelings about that? Post-pandemic, like a lot of things have changed. And I, yeah. think, I think you can hold the title of sommelier and not be on a floor. But I think if you want to work the floor and be a floor psalm, it's a different game now. Like you've got to yeah. hold maybe like one or two titles and you've got to work a little bit harder than everybody. And you got to be like the requirement to be a floor psalm here at Saison, as long as I'm here is you have to do everyone else's job better than them. Like you have mm -hmm. to be able to captain and help the bar and run food. And like, if chef needs you to do something, you better do it. But I think like, that's just post pandemic and things have changed. Yeah. And I think you can also be a sommelier and do what you do and um, work at a wine shop. That's like, you're not working 12 hours a day and like moving boxes as much yeah. and like slaving doing inventory. Over, yeah, doing inventory. I think, yeah, I agree. I, I don't like to like put it in a box. Like you can be a Psalm and do like a lot of different things. 
is the certification a requirement at Saison for you or for the restaurant? No. And it never has been. And when I got hired here, um, I mean, like, look at look at my direct boss and the yeah. owner, Mark yeah, Wright. True. True. He's probably one of the most successful self-made people I've met. Um, and he doesn't he doesn't not care about certifications, but he doesn't care about it for him. Mm. So like he's happy to support me. And if I want to go for my advanced, I'm sure he will be like, absolutely, whatever you need me to do. But he doesn't need that for himself. And I mm. think the wine director before me, Jacques Molotona, he didn't hold any certificate. I don't think he had any certifications. And he is still one of the most brilliant people I've met to this day. Mm. Yeah, my Kelly, I think Kelly was cert, Kelly certified and I don't think Scott had any sort of certification that I'm aware of. So I look how successful they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I I'm certified. I really had never my actually my my um the somebody one of the somebody that I had hired while I was working at press, she got she was an advanced somebody. She got her advance while she was working for me. So I was a certified somebody with an advanced somebody underneath of me. I think in your yeah. position, like you've got Morgan who's a Master's only working Master's over at song. Angler. Yeah. He still works the floor. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think just, you know, as we sort of wrap up this episode, you know, this, and, and again, this is, this is not a, a, a knock on pins and certifications, but if you want to research that path, you should do that. It's not an easy path. Um, it requires a lot of patience, a lot of work, a lot of study, a lot of self-study. Um, it wasn't a path that I wanted to go down or it seems like you're, you have had any interest in going down, but if you want to go down that you should. And, um, I think guild Psalm is a great place to link up with people. They've got like a, you know, message board where you can post to see if there's tasting groups going on. Guild Psalm is the best. It's a, it's such a good resource. It's a, it's a resource that I continue to, it's a hundred dollars a year. I continue to use it every single week. Anytime I'm doing research on regions or like need a little help with like, you know, finding maps, it's always a place that I go to. Um, and so for those of you who are kind of thinking about going down that path, like, please do yourself a favor, invest in that resource. It's great. Um, I've never personally taken the WSET classes. I only hear good things about it. I think it's a good way to go. Um, but if you're also someone that is like really great at self-study, like you don't have to take the class. The only thing I'll tell you is like, you got to taste, you got to taste wine and you should probably taste with people who are better than you. Cause that was the thing that I learned in New York that, I am glad that I realized early on was I was working by myself on the floor at two different places and I knew that I needed to work with other people to get better. And I knew that I needed to work with better wines. So that would be my, my biggest advice is like always surround yourself with people who are not you have different ways of studying, different ways of learning, different ways of tasting, um, and who can probably teach you a a thing or two. Cause I think that's, that is my pathway to success. If you want to be successful now, post pandemic and be a SOM on the floor, you just, you got to show up, you got to put in the time and you got to be willing to like do the grunt work because it doesn't get easier as you get a higher title. I feel like my job has only gotten more difficult. And I used to look back at being a floor SOM and being like, oh, I just want to be a wine director. And now I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, I just want to be a floor SOM. Every of the day. <laughs> Yeah, no, but you got to put in the work. I have to tell one funny story before I go because I don't think that I've ever publicly told anyone this. So when I sat for my certified exam in New York, um, it it was super last minute. And like I had, I was waitlisted and then I finally got in. Anyway, I am sitting there taking the exam or going through the blind tasting. And I, I looked down at my arms and I'm like, God, it's like, I'm so freaking itchy. Like what is happening right now? I'm still I'm trying to go through it, get through service. And like the end of service, I'm like, I feel like I am covered in mosquito bites right now. Like I'm going to die. And I looked down at my arms and I'm like, oh my God. I was like, I don't know if these are mosquito bites. Like, I don't know why it's like the fall. Like, why would I have mosquito bites right now? So I leave the quartermaster sommelier's exam. I get on the train all the way back to my apartment knowing that they're going to announce like who passes in like a few hours. I have this like four hour window. I get back to my apartment and I'm like, I think I need to check for bed bugs. And I check my bed and sure as shit, my bed has all the markings of bed bugs. No. So I, so I spend the entire afternoon like packing all my stuff up, calling my landlord in tears. I run all the way back to like Rivington Street or something down the Lower East Side just in time for them to be like wrapping everything up. And I had to ask them 
if I had passed the Gordon Master Sommelier's exam because I had missed them calling my name. So no. I did. I never. Heard. Oh my god! I didn't think anyone would have a worse certified story than me. But like you, you win. For it was sure. pretty bad. So I was covered in I was covered in bed bugs. Didn't hear my name called. Had to ask and find out if my name was actually called. But no. I passed. They spelled my name wrong on my certificate, so that was fun. Um, that was great. So I was scarred, so I never went any further. But that I've never told that story publicly, and I was like, today is probably the day that I tell people I got bed bugs and that I passed my certified. It's. Definitely the day. <laughs> now, now that everyone's itchy, um, I will, cool. uh, I, I will thank you for listening to this podcast, Molly. Thank you so much for being here. I had no idea how uh, how kindred a spirit you were, but I'm super oh. excited for all the path the past that will continue to emerge from you for you on um, whatever's next. I think there's some really cool things. Uh, people can come see you at Saison, right? That's where you're yeah. you're kicking it. I, I'm here five days a week, all day. Cool. Yeah. Week. I've, I've actually never been, so I'm very overdue. Well, please I'll rectify when I get back. I, I would love to have you in at for the full menu or the bar, whatever you want to do. I'll be there. You got it. Um, thank you so much. I know it was a Sunday. You're like one of your only day off, so I, I appreciate yeah. it. I'm drinking. Um, I'm fine. <laughs> for those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy your wines. Like, subscribe, and review this podcast, and we will see you all next time. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.